Hi, uh, so as Mika said, my name is Morgan, and this talk is about the changing face of the infocalypse, um, which is a you know, jargon-loaded term, which I'll explain in a second. Um, standard disclaimers, uh, opinions represented here are my own, uh, not approved or acknowledged by my employer in any way, uh, nor are they representative of anyone else's views other than me. Um, so, I'm Headhunter or Morgan. If you want to stay in touch with me afterwards, you can find me on the Twitter. I don't have a personal website or any of that. Carry on. Um, I've been working in the security industry for sort of over a decade now, and these days I make my daily bread as an incident responder. Um, so I hang out at Noise Bridge in San Francisco sometimes, um, EFF supporter. Recently spoke at the latest conference on um, technology and activism on practical anti-forensics. Uh, some of you guys might know me already, some of you might not. I've spoken at DeepSec a couple of times. Uh, the second DeepSec conference, I gave a talk here called Fear, Uncertainty, and the Digital Armageddon. Um, neither of the people on this slide are me. This is uh, Mika and Lynx, who are the conference organizers. Uh, so can we give them a round of applause for DeepSec? Thanks, guys. Yeah. All right. So the first time when I was here, I was sort of under the guise of a pen tester and my uh, talk was on hacking SCADA facilities, uh, sort of electrical power grids, water distribution and purification facilities, industrial processing plants, and so on. Uh, the title of this talk was a play on the acronym um, FUD, uh, sort of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, and this is a tactic frequently used in sales, marketing, uh, public relations, politics, and propaganda. Uh, it, it's generally, FUD is sort of a strategic attempt to influence public perception uh, by disseminating sort of negative, dubious, or false information uh, designed to sort of undermine credibility of existing belief. Um, the title of this talk was supposed to be humorous. Rather than being a harboring genre of digital doom, um, I was trying to sort of get everyone to calm down and think sensibly about SCADA security and the risks to the sort of systems that run our lives. Uh, I'd like to think that talk helped a little. Um, during this talk, I said something to the effect that allegations of hacking by Chinese spies and saboteurs were grossly overstated. Um, as we're going to discuss today, I was somewhat wrong about this. Um, <laughs> over the last couple of years, uh, there's been a lot of well-documented cases of nation-state-sponsored hacking, from recent CA compromises to sort of malware like Stuxnet and Dooku. Uh, a lot of talk about blended threat landscape as we now worry about um, hackers monetizing using paper install malware, uh, botnet herders selling access and hosts to uh, government interests, that sort of thing. Uh, and much like the sort of changing threat landscape, uh, the media hype du jour has kind of leveled up a lot. Uh, hacktivism, leakers, APT, SCADA attacks, espionage, sabotage, all somewhat sort of inaccurately get described under the blanket term of cyber war. Um, so there's been a significant discussion about cyber war in the industry recently. Uh, military has described cyber as the new air. And when we're not discussing cyber war, which presumably refers to the actions of nation state sponsored attackers, we're talking about cyber terrorism, uh, which seems to be a label that can be applied to just about anyone doing any sort of politically motivated hacking from WikiLeaks to Anonymous. Uh, there's some real problems with using these types of terms. Uh, they're, they're dangerous, inaccurate, and lead us to places we probably don't want to end up. Now, I like to think that security folk are skeptical by profession. And, you know, we try to be resistant to hype. And whenever you say cyber war, that's kind of exactly what you're buying into. Um, unfortunately, whether we like it or not, cyber war is a real thing. And by a real thing, I mean the Pentagon officially declared cyberspace a new war warfare domain. Uh, so this makes it verifiably a, a real thing. Uh, and big business for the military industrial complex. Uh, we already have a variety of military organizations in the U.S. fighting over who gets to run with the ball on this one. Uh, we've had a lot of literature coming out with impressively scary titles like Cyber Doom, Beyond Cyber Doom, Cyber Attack Scenarios, and Evidence of History, uh, that sort of thing. Um, in Black Hat 2010, Michael Hayden, a former general and former head of a couple of three-letter agencies, described the Internet as the fifth military domain um, with land, sea, uh, space, uh, and air being the other four, and said that cyberspace was the first man-made location for warfare. 
I'm sure no one missed the description of the internet as a military domain. Um, this type of rhetoric was recently echoed by Barack Obama, who said that cyberspace was real. And <laughs> so are the risks that come with it. From now on, our digital infrastructure, networks, and computers we depend on every day uh, should be treated as strategic national asset. Uh, so this appeared in Al Jazeera just recently, saying that innovations in technology are changing the tactics of modern-day conflict. Uh, new tools in today's arsenal of weapons, helped by advances in electromagnetics and modern information and communications technology, a new form of electronic warfare has been created. It's called cyber war, and is increasingly recognized by governments and the military as posing a potentially grave threat. Uh, this article came out yesterday, <laughs> and it was one of the most worrying headlines, uh, US military wants to shoot hackers. Uh, obviously, the title of this article was somewhat facetious, uh, but does speak to the increasing urge in the military to respond with kinetic war to threats faced by people, from people with keyboards. Um, this means, basically, if anyone carries out an attack on the Pentagon website, for instance, the Navy SEALs will land through his roof, run through the house shooting anything that moves and bury the body at sea, uh, out of respect. So, you know, clear your browser histories now. That's it. So a facetious article. Um, while much of the coverage on this is centered around the US and, and indeed the Chinese, uh, you're not entirely safe in Europe either. Uh, this came out in the register a couple of weeks ago. US and Europe run through their first joint cyber war party. Uh, this being a discussion of a drill that they had recently similar to the sort of cyber storm exercises which have been run regularly for some time. Uh, Richard Clark, a former US cyber czar and National Security Council member, described in his recent book, Cyber War, uh, it to be actions by a nation state to penetrate another nation's computers uh, for the, or networks for the purposes of causing damage or disruption. Uh, this seems to be pretty broad and kind of prone to overuse. Unfortunately, all the self-appointed experts in the field of cyber war uh, seem to be using a definition very similar to this. Seems like quite a lot of things can be called cyber war. Um, so to put this in a nutshell, cyber war is being used as a catch-all phrase to refer to politically motivated hacking um, to conduct acts like sabotage and espionage. Um, this is frequently discussed as if it were analogous to conventional warfare. As we'll discuss, this is both dubious in accuracy and political motivation. So let's take a quick look at a short history of kind of buzzword bingo to see what cyber war has wrought on us so far. Uh, some well-known uh, incidents here. Um, I think a lot of people who have any interest in the field will know all about this stuff, right? So April 2007, the Estonian DDoS incident. Hackers believed to be linked to the Russian government bring down the websites of Estonia's parliament, banks, ministries, newspapers, broadcasters, so forth. In June 2008, hundreds of government and corporate websites in Lithuania were hacked, and some are covered in digital Soviet-era graffiti, again implicating uh, Russian nationalist hackers. And in August of the same year, uh, cyber attackers hijacked government and commercial websites in Georgia during a military conflict with Russia. I mean, again, the implication is, is the Russians. Um, in September 2007, uh, Israel carried out an airstrike on Syria dubbed Operation Orchard. Uh, US military and, uh, sources speculated that the Israelis used technology similar to that used by the United States Suta airborne network attack system uh, to allow their planes to pass undetected uh, by radar into Syria. Uh, Suter is a computer program designed to interfere with uh, computers of integrated air defense systems. In 2010, on November 26th, a group calling itself the Iranian Cyber Army uh, hacked websites belonging to the Pakistan Army and sort of others belonging to different ministries, including Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Education, Finance, the Pakistan Computer Bureau, uh, the Council of Islamic Ideology, etc. And this attack was done as revenge of the Mumbai, uh, oh, sorry, the Indian Cyber Army, because this attack was done by revenge uh, for the Mumbai terrorist attacks, which had been confirmed to have involvement of Pakistani terrorists. Uh, in May 2010, in response to the Indian Cyber Army defacing Pakistani websites, a uh, thousand plus Indian websites were defaced by groups such as Pak Hacksaws, Team Poison, Urdu Hack, and Z Company Hacking Crew. Uh, among these were a variety of Indian local government websites, uh, box office in India, some missile defense websites, and the Indian Hewlett Packard help desk. Um, and finally, in September 2010, uh, something which I'm sure everyone has heard about, 
Iran was attacked by the Stuxnet one, uh, which was thought to specifically target the Natanz nuclear enrichment facility. Uh, this worm was said, largely in the media, to be the most advanced piece of malware ever discovered and appeared to have damaged the Iranian nuclear arms development program. Um, most advanced malware ever. Yeah, I've, I've heard um, similar phrases uh, when people have been talking about Stuxnet. It was certainly ambitious, however, it wasn't particularly stealthy at all. Uh, there was very little sort of critical anti-forensic oversight in its design. For instance, if you examine a memory footprint of Stuxnet, um, and you can because there's lots of copies of it floating around the internet, uh, some things really stick out. Um, for a start, it spawns multiple unhidden malicious LSAS processes. On examination, there's a bunch of problems with these additional LSAS processes. Uh, for a start, the base priority of the malicious processes is different than the base priority of legit processes. As you can see, the legitimate LSAS process has a base priority of nine. Uh, the other malicious processes have a priority of eight. Um, if you run strings on the malicious binaries, a comparison of the two uh, yields very different results. Um, the APIs you see in red are the ones hooked by the malware. In addition, the malicious processes load far fewer DILs and have far fewer open file handles than legitimate LSAS processes. Um, there's a variety of other stuff that can be found if you dig deep into Stuxnet. Um, MHL does a great analysis of Stuxnet using an open source tool called Volatility, so you can have a look, and he found sort of 18 artifacts. Um, anyway, it's sort of the most overanalyzed piece of malware ever, and despite the feeling that it was kind of written by a bunch of government contractors, it did most certainly get the job done. Um, Dooku was only recently discovered around three to four weeks ago, and it's malware either by the Stuxnet authors or possibly more likely someone that had access to the Stuxnet source code. Um, you've got some particularly predictably cyber warrior headlines around this, um, claiming that Dooku was causing collateral damage in a silent cyber war, uh, maybe that cyber war is becoming a reality, or that, you know, and so forth. The payload for Dooku was quite different. Um, instead of causing centrifuges and nuclear power plants to fail, it was largely an information gathering tool designed to steal credentials and systems information to be used in, in later operations. Um, my favorite headline of any of them was this, uh, that the Dooku Trojan was revealed to be a shape-shifting serial killer. Uh, <laughs> this is a great headline. Um, however, it's actually a reference to the show Dexter, uh, because references to Dexter were actually found in the Dooku source code. Um, However, while, while Stuxnet and Dooku are claiming all the headlines recently, um, nation state attacks aren't new. Um, Fox News called Dooku the hydrogen bomb of cyber warfare. Um, so so who, who's behind the, this campaign of infection is not yet known, although many um, campaigns of extended nation state hacking in the past have been well documented. Um, this is a very much incomplete history of APT campaigns. Uh, for those who've largely ignored all the APT hype, APT stands for Advanced Persistent Threat, um, and is usually referred to hacking sponsored by or motivated by uh, nation states, and was first used by the Navy in the US around 2006, and popularized sort of post-Aurora by uh, Mandiant's MTrends reports. Uh, much knowledge of these operations has become public due to the increased culture of disclosure post-Aurora, although some of this information was leaked in the WikiLeaks diplomatic cables. Uh, did anyone here spend innumerable nights awake searching for references to hacking in those leaked diplomatic cables? Okay, maybe it was just me that was strange. Um, so I did, and there's a lot of good stuff pertaining to hacking actually, uh, especially hacking believed to be politically motivated. I'm not going to go through all of it because there's quite a bit, uh, but Byzantine Hades is an interesting example. Uh, Byzantine Hades is a cover term for an ongoing campaign of hacking against the US government and other governments, including Germany, uh, believed to be related to China that's been going since at least 2003, probably 2002. And various groups and incidents have been given you know, uh, related code names. Um, Byzantine Candor is a subset of the Byzantine Hades intrusions and is described in the Diplomatic Security Daily from November 2008, classification secret, uh, as a series of network intrusions affecting US and foreign systems and believed to originate from the People's Republic of China. Uh, this group had been owning Windows boxes, stealing credentials, uh, the end result of which was access to hundreds of US government defense contractor um, related systems. Um, as you can see, much like pen testers, it looks like state sponsored hackers also work to a timeline and have figured out that sending people files with names like internal restructuring, or in this case, salary increase and survey forecast tip, uh, is an expeditious way of accomplishing your goals. Uh, in this case, they managed to steal a bunch of mail and a complete list of usernames and passwords for an unspecified US government agency. Um, 
They also like to use legit looking host names. Uh, as you can see, we've got a bunch of host names that are registered in Chengdu, China, that look pseudo legit like mcafeeresponse.org, uh, indexnews.org. Uh, these domains were used as command and control domains for a hacking campaign connected to the PLA. Um, another subset of Byzantine Hades, uh, Byzantine Anchor, very inventive naming convention, um, is another set of network intrusions related to the Chinese hacking crew Java file. It appears that the remote access tool they've been using ERAX was written by Java files leader Yunang Ping. So what did they hack? Well, it looks like they found this guy's Trojan that he wrote at the Pentagon. Um, as I said, there's a lot of interesting stuff in these WikiLeaks cables if you know where to look. Um, so as you can tell, this type of activity has been going on for some time. Uh, there's also information on the government of Germany suffering the same type of attacks. Because uh, the, the leaked cables were American, we don't have the same level of detail on these activities. However, what can be picked up from the US discussions on the topic is that, according to officials, the German government assessed that these efforts were conducted for the purpose of espionage and presented a significant threat to German interest. Uh, targets covered a broad range of German government activities, including military, economy, science and technology, commercial and diplomatic efforts, and research and development. Uh, the officials also indicated that espionage-focused activity increases before major negotiations involving um, German and Chinese interests. Uh, Moonlight Maze uh, was an incident in which US officials accidentally discovered a pattern of probing of computer systems at uh, the Pentagon, uh, NASA, the US Department of Energy, private universities, research labs that had begun in March 1998 and had been going on for quite some time. Our sources report that the invaders were systematically marauding through tens of thousands of files, including maps of military installations, troop configurations, and military hardware design. Uh, the United States Department of Defense traced the trail back to a mainframe computer in the Soviet Union, but the sponsor of the attacks were unknown, and you know, Russia denied any involvement. Uh, Titan Rain. Uh, this was the designation given by federal government of the United States to a series of coordinated attacks on American computer systems going back to 2003. Uh, the attacks were labeled as Chinese in origin, although their precise nature, uh, state-sponsored espionage, corporate espionage, or random hacker attacks, and also the real identities of the attackers being masked by proxies, zombie computers, and so forth, remain unknown. Uh, Titan Rain hackers gained access to many United States computer networks, including Lockheed Martin, Sandia, Redstone, Us, um, and NASA. So Operation Aurora was a cyber attack which was first publicly disclosed by Google on January 2010, and in a blog post, Google said the attack originated in China. Uh, the attack had been aimed at dozens of other organizations, uh, which Adobe, Juniper, and Rackspace publicly confirmed that they were targeted. According to media reports, Yahoo, Symantec, Northrop Grumman, Morgan Stanley, and Dow Chemical were also among targets. Um, Shady Rat said, you know, some great names here. Um, this is an ongoing set, series of cyber attacks starting in mid-2006. Basically, in this, McAfee, I think, stumbled upon a CNC dump box. Analysis of this host revealed a cornucopia of stolen data from at least 72 organizations, including defense contractors, Fortune 500 companies, United Nations, and the International Olympic Committee. So if you follow the news, there's been a bunch of other high-profile compromises this year, among them RSA and subsequently Lockheed Martin. Um, also, some high-profile CA compromises, including Komodo and Diginota. Um, recently disclosed were the Nitro attacks, in which 29 chemical companies were compromised and data was stolen. I'm not going to go into these because they've been extensively covered in the media in the last year. So what have we learned here? Um, so everyone is hacked all the time, but not by the same people, right? So I mean, at least we can take some comfort in that. Um, but sort of glibness aside, uh, we've seen these types of attacks um, for some time, and, and, and there has been sort of a significant rise in some of those types of malicious activity we see on the internet. Uh, no game of buzzword bingo would be complete without discussing the, the threat landscape these days. So it appears a long time ago what we mainly had what we call rogue actors or hackers, um, sort of hacking groups that you can enumerate on any given day. Um, the, the graph here expands much slower uh, for rogue actors than criminal enterprise because they're not fueled by cash. Basically, these guys, so hackers, um, as we understand it in the traditional sense, have always been defacing, DDoSing, and participating in sort of mostly harmless hackery. A small subset have always been really malicious and get pleasure out of destroying things, but you know, um, at the top there we've got criminal enterprise, and these are the guys who make a lot of money 
and the reason why the malware economy emerged over the last few years. Um, sort of, as we go down a bit, you get the hackers meet cash, and these guys kind of hide hands. The ones who write malware sell zero day and get sucked into the vortex of organized crime. Uh, they sort of frequently monetize via mass ownage and paper and store malware. Uh, from the bottom, you get APT, which is the type of attacks I've just described. And slightly up from this, you get sort of private hackers working for government. Uh, interesting issue is the, middle, is the middle here, which is D, uh, which is where sort of a state interest can simply buy access to adversary networks from criminals who are either selling botnets or uh, where state-sponsored attack can be vectored through private hacking groups. Uh, private hacking groups can sort of fund their interests by um, selling access um, while targeting corporations and governments. The only thing consistent here is that hacking is hacking. It frequently looks and smells similar when you see it. However, it is useful to make a threat distinction. Um, APT threats are sort of goal-driven and impersonal, and as we all know, hackers are frequently vain, ego-driven, and highly personal. Um, the different types of motivations lead to different attack patterns and attacker habits, and understanding of this is essential in formulating a useful defensive stance. So what does this kind of mean in greater context? Um, so some of the stuff does genuinely sound really bad. Uh, shutting down someone's air defensive system or destroying their nuclear weapons manufacturing facilities is definitely a real thing. It's not just hype. Uh, we happen to have a better word, though, for disabling people's air defenses and bombing them uh, than cyber war. It's, it's called war. Um, we've had this word for some time. Um, so why, why the word war metaphors? Um, so so why, why is this word so overused at the moment? Not clicks, Creek, cyber war. Um, uh, well, so, so we use the word cyber war because it works for a variety of people. It's exciting. Uh, the media really likes it. Um, it's, it's polarizing. It's an easy and yet kind of sloppy analogy, uh, which makes it easy to explain things to people that don't have any frame of reference. Uh, it's also a very convenient excuse for people that have gotten owned. Uh, so I've, I've been doing incident response for a really long time now, and I've had the opportunity to observe how lots of different organizations and people behave when they get compromised. Now, obviously, there's a lot of different psychological responses that I've witnessed, but they commonly go down two paths. People are initially shocked and distressed. So like, oh my god, we've got owned, my professional career is over, it's the end of the world, I'm going to quit my job and go live in Guatemala. Um, the, the next stage is dismissal, and this sort of follows a confirmation bias that the attacker was really lame. Like, oh my god, that guy totally used this lame tool from 10 years ago to clear logs, the tool is so 90s, what a loser. Um, and then, depending on how good your forensics guy is and how owned you discovered you really were, there's sort of a couple of routes. Um, there's hubris, which is like, ha, ah, we caught this chump, we thought he could get into our network and steal our stuff, we sure showed him. This is obviously dumb for a variety of reasons, but it's a very common reaction, especially in terms of the sort of psychology of getting over being compromised. Um, and there's kind of abrogation of responsibility. Uh, people discovering that they're super owned and that all their important IP has sailed over oceans to a dump site in Kripalakistan, uh, like this route. Um, they say, it wasn't our fault. We were targeted by a foreign government, we're victims in a cyber war. Um, it also makes your problem sound kind of sexy. In fact, war metaphors make a bunch of things sound sexy. Uh, so when all this stuff happened with WikiLeaks, as you guys might remember, uh, it was very, very exciting. Um, so John Perry Barlow, who's an awesome guy, and I have a lot of respect for, said this, uh, that the first serious info war was now engaged, and the field of battle was WikiLeaks and you other troops. Um, it's a great quote, info war, sounds awesome. Um, unfortunately, war metaphors in this scenario, and many others, can backfire really badly because they lead to this. Um, using war metaphors and calling people cyber terrorists is a great way of justifying taking actions against people you don't like. Um, as we can see, war metaphors, though, aren't just used because they sound sexy to the media. Like, war is big business. Uh, there's a lot of people making a lot of money already on this one. Um, Phoenix mentioned this earlier today when he was talking about IDSs that threaten to be anti-APT or keep LOLSEC out of your network or whatever. Um, I'm not going to mention any specific vendors because snake oil sellers are frequently highly litigious, but unsurprisingly, many of the usual snake oil products being sold by the security industry are being rebadged and rebranded in the wake of this hysteria. Um, and given that most of these are based on the same broken defense models and products like antivirus, IDS, volume assessment, you can probably take a guess as to the efficacy. Um, you also have a new breed of ambulance chasers. Um, I'm not going to name any specific firms, but if you search a little, it doesn't take long to find evidence of companies using proprietary techniques to identify corporate brick victims, contacting them, and then trying to sell them remediation services at a really high price. So, 
as we can see, war metaphors aren't just used because they sound sexy to the media. Uh, war is big business. There's a lot of people already making a lot of money on this one. Also, war makes it easier to pass legislation that people might otherwise be adverse to, like data retention laws. Um, last year, Michael McConnell, the former director of national intelligence who made headlines when he testified to Congress that the US was already in the middle of a cyber war and was losing it. Um, in the Washington Post, uh, McConnell called for re-engineering of the internet. Uh, more specifically, we need to re-engineer the internet to make attribution, geolocation, intelligence analysis and impact assessment, who did it, from where, why, and what was the result more manageable. So these types of uh, techniques when framing this argument are not new. In fact, Timothy May talked about this at length in 1988 in the cypherpunk fact. At the time, the discussion was being used to limit the use of strong cryptography in the civilian arena. Um, does anyone remember who the four horsemen of the apocalypse were? So, they weren't war, famine, pestilence, and death, uh, but indeed the internet equivalents. These were pedophiles, drug dealers, money launderers, and terrorists. Uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse is how they come in the night for your digital liberties, for your freedom of speech, the freedom of code, and for your privacy. So it'll be said that the internet is a tool for the four horsemen of the apocalypse, a tool for the drug dealers, the money launderers, the pedophiles, and the terrorists. Uh, the spectre of such horsemen was frequently used during the limitation of strong cryptography tools by civilians that you guys might remember from some time ago. Uh, for a variety of reasons, it was seen useful to restrict the use of strong cryptography by non-military. And as such, various agencies argued um, that the availability of strong cryptography to civilians would only aid pedophiles, money launderers, and so forth. Uh, the idea isn't really used in discussions about actual online criminal activity, but more about discussions about the negative or chilling effects the perception of this activity can have on the user's online experience. You can think of it as a political tactic similar to the think of the children. Um, so, I mean, and a good example of that is sort of every law on data retention that gets pushed through, um, the ability to protect children from online predators is used as you know, a motivating factor here. Uh, so, you know, we should be wary of the use of these types of devices by politically motivated parties, uh, which is, again, why we should be particularly wary of headlines like this. Um, so these types of headlines and articles not only sell copy, but they sell the na notion that we're already in a state of cyber war. Um, the position that we're in a cold cyber war and we're losing it is a very dangerous type of mentality for a start. It means that we are at war, and that's a very specific and not very nice place to be. Um, and so we should actually sort of contemplate what actually happens in a war. I mean, the first casualties are civil liberties, a well-documented history of governments passing laws, abridging freedoms of speech, uh, forbidding anti-government sentiment, sentiment uh, prohibiting behaviours promoting treason and abridging rights of press to present dissenting opinion. Additionally, increased state surveillance and monitoring of communication is a common side effect of being in a state of war. Uh, people who dissent with prevailing political viewpoints can be labelled as enemies, or more popularly these days, terrorists. Um, and the government sort of becomes the safety net for all sorts of social problems. Uh, patri patriotism escalates, and many people's ability to critically reason, for some reason, becomes highly diminished. Uh, so Bruce Schneier actually said something really smart here. He said, uh, there's a power struggle going on for control of our nation's cybersecurity strategy. Uh, the NSA and the DOD are winning. If we frame the debate in terms of war, uh, if we accept the military's expansive cyberspace definition of war, we feed our fears. We reinforce the notion that we're helpless. I mean, what person or organization can defend itself in a war? And that others need to protect us. We invite the military to take over security and ignore the limits on power that often get jettisoned during wartime. So there is some hope here. Um, like recently, I mean, I, I read a report uh, that was mentioned earlier today um, by the uh, National Counterintelligence Executive in the US that presented a report to Congress about the activities of Russian and Chinese governments in this area, and it didn't use the word cyber war once, and that actually made me quite happy. Um, there's also some saner voices in this debate, albeit in the minority. Howard Schmidt, who's a cybersecurity advisor to the Obama administration, said last year in an interview at RSA, there is no cyber war. Instead, Schmidt said the government needs to focus its cybersecurity efforts to fight online crime and espionage. 
Um, he said, I think that cyber war is a terrible metaphor and a terrible concept, and there's no winners in that environment. So if you take nothing else away from this talk, think critically about what you're discussing. Is it actually war? Um, more likely it's sabotage, espionage, or plain old cybercrime. It's likely that a war metaphor isn't actually warranted um, in this. So packets are not bullets, and once you start talking like they are, you reach all kind of very wrong conclusions about what kind of actions are justified. Uh, so next time you're thinking of using the word cyber war and then you realize you're gonna use it non-ironically, remember that you're really assisting these guys. So just generally don't. <laughs>